Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 570. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 28th of January, 2020. All right, welcome to another program where you get to sit down with the three of us and hear our views on almost everything and anything. That's just the way Anglican Unscripted works. We're unscripted. Uh, before I get too far into the program, this is a show we're about to get to 6,000 subscribers. In the realm of YouTube, that's not big. In the realm of Anglicanism, oh my lord, I can't believe that many people sign on and subscribe to the program. We thank you for that. Before we get any further, we need you to help with the program so that uh, mm. YouTube and Facebook and uh, other algorithms around the world will kind of boost our, our performance and our search results. And you do that by clicking the like button. It's that little thumbs up. It's either on YouTube or it's on Facebook. And that helps uh, Facebook and YouTube understand that, well, at least in your world, we're important. And we appreciate that very much. We need you to continue the episode. The episode doesn't stop in 45 minutes when I press the stop button. It never stops. It continues forever in the comments. There's another comment just moments ago on last week's episode. We really appreciate it. We read the comments. We have our favorite commenters. There's less and less trolls. I don't know. Maybe we don't, we don't react to the trolls like the trolls would like to be reacted to. Apologize. Sorry. We're, we're letting the trolls down, but we're not letting the commenters down. We read your comments. We comment your comments, and we appreciate your comments. Still, 50% of this audience has not subscribed yet. I don't know. Some psychology I don't understand. I subscribe to stuff I like. I do. I click the little red rectangle that says subscribe and the little bell that pops up, I click that too. So I get instant notifications to my favorite shows like, well, I, I guess I'd only watch bicycling shows and Anglican theology podcast. I'm kind of limited in my education. That's oh, the way Kev, I am. Kevin, yes? maybe it's maybe we're using the wrong vocabulary because huh? if we if we would ask Gavin to subscribe uh, to the thirty nine articles, does that mean he gets them in his <laughs> <laughs> Or does it, I mean, in other words, there might be some loaded language in the word <laughs> subscribe. Right. What when you subscribe, does that mean that you support, love us, everything oh, we do? Yes. You're we're our, you're your heroes, or is that you just get noticed when the show comes out? Thumbs up, you love us. Subscribe means you want to know when we're around. That's that's as simple as it gets. Good point, George. Because uh, you know, I can think of councils of the church I don't necessarily fully subscribe to. So Gavin would subscribe to new <laughs> articles of the Church of England should they come out to, to get notice of them, but he would not necessarily subscribe to the articles of the Church of England when they come out. There you out. go. We got that covered, I think, finally. Uh, let's talk about Welby Goes to Kenya. Uh, Justin Welby was in Kenya when you and I were in Kenya back for GAFCON 2. Uh, we went there to Nairobi, he flew in, and we saw how a man, an Archbishop of Canterbury, can change his message from one sermon to another. <laughs> from uh, 9 to 11. <laughs> from 9 to 11. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, oh. I, I, I saw he was going in there. I know that uh, Kenya may be considered a, a weak link in the uh, GAFCON ethos, and he was going to go in there to help set the record straight about the benefits <clears throat> of going to Lambeth. Lambeth 2020 may be the single greatest moment in history because once and for all, the church can address climate change. And I thought, eh, maybe he'll go in there and talk to the Kenyans about climate change and get their approval um, and get their go ahead. But the primate, as far as I understand, as of uh, January 28th, uh, 9 a.m. Eastern Central Time is not going, George. There, now, friends, for those of you who complained about inside Anglican baseball, this is going to be one of those innings. We're going to talk about the in interior workings of the communion based on our conversations with those involved. This goes back to uh, 
Yes, Justin Welby, and I think he still might be in Kenya. He's doing the grand tour of the country, seeing schools and colleges and this okay. and that. And he's being treated well, and he met with the House of Bishops of the, at All Saints Cathedral, Nairobi, this past week. Going back a few years, Eliud Wabakula was one of the giants of the GAFCON movement. He was the Archbishop of Kenya. Uh, we had the, the Lusaka Zambia meeting of the Anglican Consultative Council. And the Episcopal, and one of the people running to be the next archbishop was the Bishop of Nairobi, Joel Waweru. And Joel was marshalling support among the Kikuyu, which in Kenya we still have tribal divisions, so that the Kikuyu all vote in lockstep, the Mount Kenya area bishops, and people from the coast and, and from the west and from the north. Well, Waweru was to be the representative, Episcopal representative, to the ACC meeting in Lusaka. And Eliud Wabakula and the House of Bishops decided we're not sending a delegation. And then Eliud Wabakula went up country to visit, do some pastoral visits, and Joel Waweru forged Eliud Wabakula's name uh, electronically. He disseminated a letter with cut and pasted Wabakula's name saying, we're now going. And he went to uh, ACC Lusaka, along with a, a, a clergy and lay delegate. Well, where uh, Weliad Wabakula said this was a forgery. He told Kevin and I on the record in a recorded interview, this was a forgery. And Waweru, for his troubles, was elected to the ACC Standing Committee as one of the Africa representatives. Waweru was then appointed to the Lambeth Organizing Committee. And he's been sent on a number of uh, oh, uh, vanity project type things. He was sent as the Anglin Re Anglican representative to Rome for the Synod on the Family, uh, things of that nature. He, he, his uh, currying favor with London has paid off. It didn't pay off in the end, however, because he was not elected bishop. Jackson Ole Sappet, who right. is a Maasai, and they're a smaller tribe, though they may be familiar for, to us by the by from adventure stories. Uh, at, was elected archbishop, so Waweru is all in on the Lambeth agenda. It's not because he's theologically liberal, but you have to remember these are church politics, and the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So, Welby has been pushing Kenya to break the Lambeth boycott. Rwanda, Nigeria, Uganda, and in May, uh, Archbishop Jackson Olisap had said, we're not going, I'm not going, and most of my guys aren't going as well. He knew Waweru and Waweru's allies were going to go. That was not an issue. But the Kenyan church as a corporate entity was not going to go. So fast forward to this past week. Welby takes, gives the full court press of... Uh, projects and working with mission societies to show how the money is flowing from the West into Kenyan projects. He meets with the House of Bishops, tells them all these wonderful things that we're, we're going to move on from the uh, focus on the past. We're going to be a grown-up church. Now, you have to decode this. What does this mean? The Africans for years have been saying, why does every Anglican meeting have to be about the Episcopal Church and the Canadians? Fair it's, point. It's why can't we just talk about Islam? Why can't we talk about you know the things that are real to us, not the desire of the Bishop of Buckingham to have gay marriage? So Welby says we're now a grown-up church where we're basically agreed that we're not going to talk about this and then talk about important stuff like climate change, like uh, mosquito nets and things of that nature. So after all of this heavy, heavy, heavy-handed attempt to get Jackson Ole Sappet on side, uh, this past week uh, Ole Sappet said, "I'm still not going," and I'm, and uh, many of my uh, compatriots are not going. Some will go, but those who are going, they're going in their personal, individual capacity. They're not going as representatives of the Anglican Church of Kenya, and those who do will take a message from Kenya, voicing our disapproval over the uh, 
uh, failure of the communion to discipline the Episcopal Church of the United States and its allies. Gavin, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury for the longest time has brought a lot mm -hmm. of street cred to African and Asian nations. Uh, they are able to, in their own minds, uh, somewhat combat the influence of radical Islam by saying, listen, we have connections with London through the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's an emissary. He brings um, political credit to what we're doing. Is that always going to be the case? Or has, because he's losing religious favor, is the Archbishop of Canterbury's office uh, always going to have this influence in Africa? Well, this is a key question, and it highlights the fact that there are two major threats coming from, uh, you might say, the left and the right, but I don't mean that politically. So the one is from the left is cultural Marxism and all to do with identity politics and the way in which sexuality is used as a revisionist tool for reformatting society. And the Church of England has on the whole swallowed that whole. And then the other is from Islam. And up until now, the England has been quiet about Islam. There's been a number of attempts to offer a degree of syncretism. But one of the, one of the ways in which the, the situation is changing was given as an example by Prince Charles the other day, who was saying how um, having long been in love with Islam as a, um, as a cultural channel of sophistication, uh, he prays in Arabic and he even has, he even mimics, or mimics is not the right word, he even borrows the Islamic poet of Inshallah, and he was talking to a, a group of people who were sympathetic to this. But this, this ought to cause us a very considerable amount of alarm, alarm because um, for those people who know much about Islam, much of the propaganda we've been having over the last 20 or 30 years uh, is, is exposed and exploded. We've been told, for example, that, that Islam is a cousinly faith to Judaism and Christianity, that it's one of the three Abrahamic faiths. We've been told that Allah is the same God as Yahweh. We've been reminded that Palestinians pray to Allah as if to prove it's the same God. They do indeed, but they mean something very different by the word. Um, and the problem we have is that, Islam, that, the, that the Islamic God, Allah, is very different from our, from the God of the Bible. Uh, but it's it's part, I suppose, of the of the revisionist and the um, uh, the relativist agenda to suggest that it's all one basic project. And it's really quite important that we bring some biblical and and philosophical and theological distinctions to bear in a way that Prince Charles has completely failed to do. When I think of quintessential. Britain and quintessential Church of England, I think of Prince Charles. Um, I think of somebody who, in my mind, well-educated, uh, well-catechized, and uh, a future king of England with whom the church can be well-pleased and safe under. Maybe my assumptions are wrong, Gavin. Well, I think that I think I think I think they're wrong. I'd say they're ludicrously wrong. They're tragically wrong. They're catastrophically wrong. Um, there's no evidence of Prince Charles. Well, I mean, he may be well. The people who taught him may have been clever, but it, it's, it's not clear he's got a grasp, a theological grasp of of his own faith, and certainly he doesn't have a grasp of of Islamic faith. I mean, one of the things that we ought to rehearse just for the moment is that uh, that that Allah in Islam, uh, which simply means the God, was mm -hmm. one of was about 350 polytheistic gods that Arabs had, and Muhammad. Uh, elevated him to, to 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 being the god, but his his characteristics are entirely different from Yahweh. For example, um, he is he, you can't have a relationship with him. Again, there is a there's a constant presumption in West amongst Western Christians who are not theologically very astute that somehow really um, Islam is an Arabic form of Judaism. God would mean. Um, the same God we've always talked about, but in Arabic dress. But nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the God that we have, that Jesus 
uh, and the Jewish prophets came to introduce us to is a God with whom we have a relationship. The moment the Bible starts, we find that with Adam and all the way through the prophets, there is this living, dynamic, reciprocal relationship. And slowly, um, Yahweh emerges out of the mist of I am that I am, which is the, one of the most profound names connoting being and character. Uh, and what we do as Christians is we, we develop a relation, a living relationship with him. We get to know him better. And the only way we can possibly do that is because, first of all, Jesus shows us how it's done. And then Jesus makes it possible by allowing us to stand in his presence without being overwhelmed by the gap between us made up of our sins. Now, this is not possible. None of this is possible with Allah. Uh, Allah is not, you, you have no relationship with him. You only know that he has his will and his will can be anything it can be reasonable or capricious uh, and when the muslim says inshallah what he's really saying is whatever the will of god is capricious good nice nasty understandable non-understandable uh, it's all vengeful. it's okay with me yeah, yeah. <laughs> and vengeful. it's okay with me um and then of course allah says uh, that jesus is not the son of god now in the new testament we're given a discernment lesson. Uh, we're told that there are spirits around and spirits form uh, are different spirits. And St. John warns us that if any spirit says, Jesus is not the Son of God, then it's an evil spirit. Well, that means for Christians that Mohammed was channeling an evil spirit because they deny that Jesus is the Son of God. And of course, all the names that Mohammed adduces as part of the Quran uh, Isha, uh, Mary, for Jesus, Miriam, uh, Abraham, Moses. These are not remotely the real characters in the Jewish Bible. Uh, they're characters he's given the same names to, to provide a degree of, of, of credibility for his project. So the, the, then you ask, well, what does this matter? Is this just abstruse theology? And the answer is, well, it matters enormously because a society based on this the, the will of Allah, the implacable, unknowable God, is a society where God is pleased when you impose his laws in a legalistic way, Sharia law. Sharia law is utterly different from the um, economy of relationships that, that the Jewish law has and that Jesus mediates. Um, there is no forgiveness in Islam, certainly not with God. And if there's no forgiveness with God properly, then there's not much forgiveness between people. But Christianity is 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 founded and rooted in the possibility of forgiveness. It's, it's what makes our steps lighter. It's, what's, it's what allows us to get up in the morning. It's what allows us to shed all the failure of, of our whole lives. Um, and so the idea that, that, the, that the kind of societies and the people that these two gods produce are, are remotely similar is a, is a horrendous idea. Now, if Prince Charles says he plays in Arabic and he talks to Allah and says, Inshallah, as a, as a Muslim would, which he clearly is saying, then there are two real problems. One is he doesn't really know much about Islam or he would become a Muslim. But perhaps the worst problem is he doesn't know much about Jesus. <laughs> and he may not be a very well-informed Christian. So the great danger is that Prince Charles doesn't understand Islam properly or he'd become a Muslim. But worse than that, he doesn't understand Christianity properly. And, and if that's true, then the prospect of the Supreme Governor of the Church of England uh, being somebody who, uh, who doesn't have a full grasp on who Jesus is and how one lives in Christ. Well, I think the polite phrase is that's, that's suboptimal for the Church of England, suboptimal for the country. It, it's actually a tragedy. And then you have to say, well, who's teaching Prince Charles about the faith? Uh, and then the, the answer is that, that they're not doing a very good job. But there's a spin-off from here, which, which some of our listeners have pointed out, and that is that there are constantly popping up in Anglican cathedrals joint interfaith services where well, there's one in, in the Diocese of Bath and Wells taking place very shortly. And one of the questions is, what, what view should Christians take? Because some of the clergy are, are, are as badly educated as Prince Charles and think they are addressing the same God. I mean, one test you can do is simply say, in our interfaith services, can we address every prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord? And you'll be told very quickly, you can't, <laughs> because that will offend Allah and the Muslims. Well, if you're in a cathedral 
and you can't address a prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord, then this is a prayer meeting you shouldn't be at. Mm. Uh, uh, may I? Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. There, there are two or three directions I would have run with what Gavin said. One is I want, I think we should cut Prince Charles some slack. He's not a theologian. Um, he's a politician whose desire is to keep the House of Windsor where it is. And so he will pander to various constituencies to make sure that come the revolution, the Windsors will survive. And it's not unexpected that he will uh, take time to soft soap uh, um, the Muslim demographic. Prince Charles goes to, is a patron of the prayer book society. I mean, does that mean we think that Prince Charles is a super high Anglican that we can... No, it just means that Prince Charles is out for Prince Charles in the House of Windsor. Second, we need to remember that in the United States, we went through this nonsense at the start of the Iraq War. I remember watching Condoleezza Rice, the Secretary of State at the time, saying Islam is a religion of love. And George uh, W. Bush, the president, saying that Jesus and Allah, you know, got the God of Jesus and the God of Allah are exactly the same. Now, I. I don't want to get into the intelligence or not of George W. Bush, but this was for political purposes. But what it led to is it led to tens, uh, thousands of deaths, billions of dollars spent with the idea that the Muslim world could be made into little American worlds because they're basically their uh, cousin Christians use uh, of a different name and they share the same basic morality, they share the same basic understanding of human nature and all they need is our, uh, is our nation building to help them. Well after 25 years what do we have to show for any of this? Not a thing. Christianity is not Islam. Is Allah is, a, is the God to whom you submit. It is not the God whom you love or who loves you. It's they are so they are they are different faiths, they're different religions, and on on one level this idiocy uh that is part political correctness, part stupidity, and part the continuation of the failures of the American foreign policy elite since uh since they kicked MacArthur out of Korea. It's the congenital stupidity of half educated elites. Uh, who don't take religion, who don't take people seriously and seek to impose their worldviews, which are unformed, but which are comfortable on, on a world which will have none of it. Well, Justin Welby flew into radical Islam Central. Uh, Africa is being uh, divided in little civil wars over uh, the fight for Islam uh, over Christianity. And we're seeing this at, in the political realms of Sudan. Uh, certainly it's going to be Uganda, Tanzania, uh, Nigeria. Right now we're seeing a repeat of the genocide in the Congo, northeastern mm -hmm. Congo. And what's happening is Muslim warlords are moving in. Uh, and Congo is not part of the Muslim belt, yet they are seeking to bring it about. We're seeing, you know, we've been reading, you know, in uh, Burkina Faso and Mali, especially in the Central African Republic, where there's not an Anglican present, but presence, but the country is majority Christian, evenly divided between Catholics and evangelicals. They are at a war to the death with militant Islam, who seeks to. There's no. Uh, there's a certain point in which when the Muslim population re reaches a certain level then Islam says it's in charge 51 percent we also found you know every week the Boko Haram released another video of a, a Christian they've killed uh, for past crimes that the Christians have committed you know this is this is war central <clears throat> but this is the, what's happening but the other I, thing I think we need to uh, and this is the, the final point that I wanted to piggyback onto what Gavin said is that in the midst of all this, what we're getting out of the Middle East, out of Iran, out of Algeria, is, and you've had uh, Father Argo on this show to talk about this, is the unprecedented number of Muslims converting to Christianity. Mm -hmm. In Iran, uh, when the Shah fell, uh, putting to one side the ethnic Armenian and other indigenous communities, there were maybe four or 5,000 Iranian Christians. Now the estimates are that there are hundreds of thousands of them after 
what, 30 odd years of okay. severe persecution. The last six months have been amazing for Iran uh, as far as baptisms and catechesis of uh, Christians going on left and right. And part of this, you know, part of this is, is the corruption and failure of the Islamic establishment, but at the same time, the nature of God as being, as understood in the Christian world, it, of the God of love, of God of forgiveness, of God of transformation, none of which applies to Islam. That is taking individuals one by one by one into the Christian faith. One of the things we were told really very often by African Christians was that as the Western church sought to legitimize homosexuality, this was going to make the task of evangelizing Africans incre incredibly difficult for the church because the natural African culture was much more similar to Islam where they said this is, this is not, this is haram, this is not allowed, this is unacceptable. And for Christianity to appear to be the vehicle of, of corrupt, as they saw it, and, and decadent liberal values uh, was profoundly difficult for African African Christians. But I think it's worse now. We, we, face, uh, we face the growth of Islam uh, in, uh, in, in England, and the only way it will be held back is if Muslims are brought to Jesus. But at the moment, there seems no sign whatsoever within any of the mainline churches that it is the job of Christians to talk about Jesus to their Muslim neighbors, to show him what it's really like. I was listening to some wonderful Orthodox uh, music um, this morning on YouTube, and uh, actually a hymn to Mary as it happens. And, and all the way through, it was peppered with comments from Muslims saying, I'm a Muslim, but I love this. I was a Muslim, I've converted. And in fact, there were dozens of Muslims saying, I've come to Jesus and I'm listening to this. Um, given the clash of civilizations and cultures we have, and I would say to my gay friends who listen, please don't be offended when I say that the Western church is uh, acting as a vehicle of, of decadence because the way in which Islam is going to treat homosexuals and gay people in our society is, 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 is going to be utterly and completely lethal and, and, and out of love for you as much as anybody else, we would like to protect you and defend you from the horrors of Islamic repression against people whose sexuality is variable. So um, this is not, a, you know, we find ourselves in a position where, where we want the Christian church to wake up and it isn't helped by Prince Charles being theologically uneducated and illiterate. Who is going to help the world? from House of Bishops Church of England pastoral statements. You know, we talked uh, last week about the House of Bishops pastoral statement on civil partnerships, with which I can't find anybody who's willing to say they agreed to it in the first place, uh, this statement. All we see is, uh, how dare we say that? I can't believe we said that. And well, a few I thought, have... oh yeah, go on. Well, a few people have reprimanded me <laughs> for being cynical. I was quite careful last week. I, I said, look, here are, t here are two views you can take. And, uh, but rather than being free to take two views, some people said you shouldn't have even articulated the cynical one. But I'm afraid the developments since we've spoke show that the cynical one was right. Yeah, they, they don't believe the, what they uh, said. Yeah, I agree. They, they, they don't believe. I mean, the, the, the whole statement came out by accident. Uh, it came out because the uh, because the government were forced by a court decision to extend civil partnerships to heterosexual couples. The church had misread the nature of civil partnerships from the very beginning uh, and got caught up. But actually, it's 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 almost more serious than that. Not only does the church not not believe what it says, but the commentariat in England have have given the church a, a huge hiding, saying that its basic job is to follow secular ethics to allow sexual behavior to be dictated by secular society and not to be a killjoy in any kind of way. And you don't hear, I haven't yet had anybody at a senior level in the Church of England say, you know, in fact, we are going head to head with you on this. We have a different cultural, a different spiritual, a different ethical hierarchy. And to be a Christian is not to be religious or to be a member of the church. It is to take a, an entirely different view. It's to be a different kind of person living a different kind of life. Um, so part of the weakness of the church in the West at the moment is 
the inability of its leaders to articulate a Christian vision. I, I won't say it's universal. Um, in the British media, yes, uh, letters to the editor and op-eds are being solicited from only one side. Fault for the day will have Giles Frazier on rubbishing it, and you will never find somebody come on the next day in support of it. But the BBC, I think it was Radio 4, or had Ian Paul, who's on the Archbishop's Council, he's an evangelical scholar, uh, debating uh, another, uh, debating an opponent, plus he was debating the interviewer who was on the opponent's side. So that there are people there, they just aren't dressed in purple, and they and there are so that they are not, uh, they're either not bishops or those who will take a stand are not invited onto the national platforms to speak. It, it's, uh, it's Ian Paul and I, Ian Paul is a is a, an excellent theologian. He and I don't see eye to eye together on everything, and we we have an enjoyable sparring relationship in public sometimes but he's distinguished himself um enormously in the way he's handled this issue. and if there's a way of getting him to articulate it here that would be very good indeed i've read some catholic commentators who are actually disappointed in their leadership because the anglican position is identical to the roman catholic position and the they're seeing the anglican position being rubbished by the uh by the elites and the bishops of the catholic church I am told by co Catholic commentators that don't follow them all, are just as silent as the Anglican ones. They're keeping their heads down too. Yes, I'm afraid it's true. The The, the view is that um, the, the significant majority of Catholic bishops in England and Wales uh, have followed, have been educated in the same liberal and progressive theological mold as many of the Church of England ones. The difference, I think, perhaps is that um, whereas they personally may be sympathetic in the way that the Anglican bishops are too, um, the the structures and the doctrine of the church, the weight of the magisterium, <clears throat> uh, restricts them from expressing their personal views when they conflict um, the, the the teaching of their church officially. So that's one reason we don't hear from them. <clears throat> but but there are there are two remarkably remarkably good bishops. Um, one is Mark Davis, a bishop of Shrewsbury, um, who received me into the, into the Catholic Church, and the other is Philip Egan, the bishop of Portsmouth, who's a close friend of his. And these two particular are are known for for, for leading an orthodox renewal movement within the Catholic Church uh, in England and Wales, and, and it's my privilege to, to be there to want to help them do it. But George is absolutely right. The others have not distinguished themselves in their, in their protection and defense well, of the I, gospel. I would like to insert here that we have finally heard from Church of England bishops who have been silent now for uh, months, if not years, on, on big topical issues within Britain. They finally speak out opposing something that they publish. So at least we get to hear from them. Well, here again, it's sort of a, it's sort of a mealy-mouthed and a mendacious opposition. Uh, Alan Wilson, the Bishop of Buckingham, who really is what I would call a piece of work, uh, published a statement that had some outright fabrications about what the statement did say and didn't say. Uh, but then most of the statements have been along the lines of the Bishop of Gloucester, who apologized for its tone and for not properly sugarcoating and hiding the church. In other words, she was apologizing for the church's teachings. She didn't say it was wrong. She said, but I'm sorry this hurt your feelings, but I'm ashamed to say this is what we believe. And I was caught out because I don't understand how the mechanisms of the House of Bishops work. And so it, in, in some respects, the, uh, the bishops speaking out are those who are don't have the strength of their convictions. Now, you, I may make fun of Bishop Wilson, but he has the strength of his convictions. He'll speak out. The others are apologizing for upsetting people, not saying that this is a, a false teaching. Bishop Peter Hancock, with his lady suffragan bishop, did exactly the same thing. They, they released a statement saying, we're aghast at how hurt people have been by this, and we commit ourselves to more listening and learning <clears throat> as we prepare for the living in love uh, and faith process. Uh, which I'm afraid is, is I think, an execrable example of exactly what George is talking about. You know, I think I have a solution for this. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this, uh, this type of gathering before. It's called Indaba. It's where you get a group of people together and you just talk about a topic to death. You don't, you're not allowed to make a decision on the topic, 
but you're allowed to talk it to death. I think the Church of England should adopt something like this. They probably never heard of it before. It's an African tradition. Um, I would encourage you guys to look into that, please. Guys, do we have any other news out here? I'm looking at my notes, and I think uh, we've covered out House yeah, of Bishops. The, the, the one thing I want to circle back around to our opening uh, item, uh, where we we'll go back deep inside Anglican baseball, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, there's going to be a new province, the Anglican Communion, the province of Alexandria, which is the Diocese of Egypt, plus North Africa, and then uh, two in uh, Ethiopia, the whole, um, two Ethiopian dioceses. It'll be under the province of an archbishop, and Munir Nice will be the archbishop. Now, just... Uh, is he... I thought he was still just the bishop of... He, he will be... The, he's the bishop of Egypt. He's right. the former archbishop of the province of Jerusalem in the Middle East. Right. But once uh, it gets advanced to the first division, he'll become an archbishop again. Okay, I just... that This is so inside baseball. I want to be sure that people who said, wait, he was an archbishop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, what George said is right. Why has Munir Nice, who in the past has been such a strong opponent of the progressive agenda, why is he going to Lambeth? Why is he going to the primates meeting? Why is he playing ball? Why he at the Lambeth, at the Canterbury primates meeting where this all sort of blew up and was a very strong voice for the uh, traditional movement, what's going on here? Well, you can read a little article in the Egyptian, uh, in the Catholic press today, the Fides News Agency, which is a missionary news agency service. The uh, Egyptian government is changing its law on the disposition of church property. And the Egyptian government uh, has basically lumped, in the past, lumped the Anglicans with all other Protestant churches into one group, calling it the Evangelical Church. And the Evangelical Council in Egypt is controlled by Presbyterians. And we've written on Anglican Inc. about the attempts by the Presbyterians to take title to Anglican property. The Catholics don't have this problem. The various Orthodox don't have this problem because they're their own freestanding uh, entity. Munir Nice, part of the desire for the province of Alexandria is to go to the Egyptian government and say, we are a freestanding church part of a larger international denomination, but we're not just another Protestant sect. And the reason is that we can control our properties from the depredations of the Presbyterians. So what's the Anglican baseball thing? Until Munir Anis gets his domestic problems, which is losing his cathedral. I mean, the Presbyterian uh, backed evangelical council has taken over Anglican properties, put in their own ministers, and tried to control finances. In other words, you talk about Catherine Jeffrey Shorey taking away churches from their rectors. We see this in Egypt within the Christian community. Munir Anis's short-term goal is legal standing to be able to protect his church and his properties, which are growing. To do that, he has to play ball with the instruments of community, communion, the ACC, Archbishop of Canterbury. So the Archbishop of Canterbury can write a letter uh, to, in Munis's pleading to the Egyptian president saying, please do this. This is the, this is, if you will, the problem for Gafcon. It does not have that degree of perception of international strength. Never mind that Vice President Mike Pence is a member of the ACNA. They just don't, the ACNA and company just don't wield those sorts of things, artillery out to fight the local battles that the bishops need to fight. In fact, it's kind of a paradox. More people are willing to pay to go to a GAFCON than go to uh, Lambeth for free. Uh, yet it doesn't have the, the international influence yet, I, hopefully one day in the future it does, that the Sea of Canterbury offers, that street cred. Um, you know, it's one of those paradoxes. Hopefully, it's a short-term paradox. Uh, well, and within... from now, from an international perspective, for the mm -hmm. for the Welby uh, Welby team and the ACC team, the worst thing that can happen is disestablishment. Because mm -hmm. once you oh, cut yeah. the Church of England free, at this last primates meeting, they've raised an issue which has been raised by the Gafcon primates many, many times. Well, perhaps the chairman of the of the primates meeting shouldn't just be the Archbishop of Canterbury automatically. 
Perhaps the Archbishop of Canterbury should just be the primate of England, and amongst ourselves, we elect an Archbishop. We elect a, a primus unto pares, first among equals. And of course, uh, that gets shot down by the establishment because that takes away, uh, if you will, the Archbishop of Canterbury, as we've discussed many, many times, his standing within England is disappearing. There are calls for the Lord bishops to get rid of the house, bishops to be kicked out of the House of Lords. There's the perennial call. If Corbyn came in, would we see Bills Gavin uh, calling for disestablishment of the Church of England? The whole cast of cards could fall in with the change of government in England. It could fall in uh, internationally. And this is what I mean by international baseball. These are considerations uh, in people's decision making that sometimes leave observers to scratch their head and say, why did they do that? Indeed. Well, I mean, one of the big problems of this day and age is the small minority of Twitter uh, hellions uh, that can have such great influence on corporations, churches, uh, and political thought for the day. Uh, I assume at any one point there's no more than 20 Twitter uh, transgendered activists who tweet all day long and attack and cause cancellations and stuff like that. Um, but these small minorities have such a great voice because of social networking. Well, the, the wonderful thing is they're all on medical disability for psychiatric <laughs> disorders, so they're paid to stay home and tweet. George said that, not Kevin. <laughs> Have we lost Gavin again? He no, looks, he looks Gavin, very solemn. Hello, Gavin. I no. you must have frozen. Well, let, let's sign off. <laughs> anyway, I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. And that's and Gavin Ashton. That's Gavin Ashton, who the internet has decided to. He looks really solemn. I mean, that's really a good pose. You've been watching episode 570, January 28th, 2020, of Anglican Unscripted. Oh, breaking news. The next episode of Anglican Unscripted will have a special interview with Archbishop Foley Beach.